Okay. So it would be interesting to know how the uh, dependent arising fits in with these steps or how you, yeah, because we touched upon that topic yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yes. First off, um, an important point to make is that Sutta number nine is Samaditi, which would mean translated as to right view. And the whole sutta is about Paticca Samuppada, the various steps in it, taken actually in this sutta in reverse order. Now, uh, if the name of the sutta is right view, you can also see, well, wait a minute, there's got to be a connection with the Eightfold Noble Path if Paticca Samuppada is in fact right view. Especially when the Buddha puts it is, is that uh, uh, he starts off Sutra number 117, the great 40, this way. He says, pay attention, monks. I'm going to teach you about Sama Arya Samati with its supports and requisites. In other words, he's going to teach the whole path in relationship to this thing that we can translate into English as unification of mind. When the mind is fully collected together in a unity, this is the samadhi. This is not concentration. This is a kind of a mind that's full of wisdom and has no uh, breaking points or cracks in the egg or any of that kind of stuff. And that the path to this state has seven requisites, and the first one then the Buddha talks about is right view. Right noble view starts first. And then he describes right view as the difference between wrong view and ordinary right view. Wrong view, we could take it would be as chaos. But it's also in the way of thinking about it is no to everything that's important to society. To where the things that are important to society, we would put as ordinary right view. In other words, uh, law and order is better than lawlessness. But law and order doesn't make everybody happy. It only improves things, but it doesn't end the problem that lawlessness started. So having law and order does not solve the problem of lawlessness. It takes something else. Hmm. Okay, something higher than that. So in that regard, then, the no that we would say, like no to mom, no to dad, no to comma, no to uh, spiritual leaders, no to rules, no, just... I'm, a, I'm not affected. This is kind of the mentality of the drive-by shooter. So long as I've got my peace, I'm ready for action. And you can see that that kind of uh, mentality uh, causes criminality. It actually is the worst of our society. Is this wrong view that basically can be stated is I can get away with anything. Hmm. Nothing has any effect upon me. So that's the wrongest of wrong views, and yet many people will say, well, that's what the Buddha teaches, but no, that's not right. That the Buddha teaches something higher, more noble than that. So that I can get away with anything uh, while it has truth in a context. In this context, I can go around harming people, hurting things, doing damage, and not have to suffer any of the consequences for my bad behavior. That's wrong view. Right view then means that there is mom, there is dad, there is generosity, there are religious leaders, there are laws, rules, rites, and rituals. But unfortunately, this kind of right view leads to clinging. It ripens in clinging, which means it ripens ultimately in suffering mainly because we want to do good in order to get good results. So this kind of uh, uh, right view 
actually very much incorporates the law of karma to where wrong view destroys the law of karma. This is the full incorporation of the law of karma to where a higher view is. No, we, we have to actually look at it realistically in detail. We cannot just say it's bad to have no law of karma. Therefore, it's good to have the whole law of karma. It needs to be looked at. Hmm. So the ordinary right view is not noble. It's what everybody strives for in our society. And it winds up making rich people richer and poor people poorer because people follow their greed. They follow what they want and they do it within a framework that that allows them to get away with things that if we had better rules or they had a better conscience, they wouldn't be doing. Okay, so ordinary right view would be to just find out how the causalities work and use them to my best own interest? Perhaps, yes. And you can also understand that that's where magic comes in, that the that, that, uh, ordinary right view is magical. So I take because, these... it, it, because it hopes for a better future, without doing the kinds of things that it's going to be taking to get it. We believe in magic. We, we believe in rebirth. I'll get another go at it. All of that kind of stuff is in built into ordinary right view. And that's why it ripens in clinging. And it's not really liberating. Mm, so I, for example, I I uh, try to follow the laws in my country, and I hope if I keep doing that, then everything will be good, something like that. Right. And, and in fact, that's what almost everybody thinks, and yet there will be things that happen. Even though you follow all of the rules, there will be some corrupt police that will bust you anyway, or you'll get busted and there's no cops around. Hmm. You run your car into a tree or something like that. Who knows what it is? But we have the idea if I follow all the rules, I'll be okay. You just said that. And following all the rules is no guarantee. The friend I talked to yesterday, he's uh, he, in the last months, he became very active in climate activism and he. Uh, they ups, they do civil disobedience, so they actually let themselves be um uh yeah Arrested. caught by the okay. police imprisoned mm -hmm. possibly for what they believe is a i guess higher goal than the laws yes and your question <laughs> yeah it, it reminded me of that that uh, i'm not fully sure where it is going yet but i have a feeling that noble right view might be more in line with your own uh, understanding of what is right action? Well, actually, one's right action is to refrain from wrong action. So with right noble view, I'm satisfied with life. Therefore, I don't need to go out and help those people by going to jail with those who were complaining about the climate change. But I'm sure, in fact, through right view, that eventually enough people will care about the climate that that will be taken care of all on its own without me having to do much of anything about it other than have good cheer for them. Mm -hmm. But a better way of doing it is, don't you wish those guys, instead of being out there actively uh, participating in, let us say, semi-violence, because non-violently getting arrested is not non-violent. That's, <laughs> that's semi-violence at, at best. But wouldn't it be better for each individual one, instead of having all of that heat in his own mind and all that anger about how terrible it is that the environment is going to bust, that he could give us a call, learn about meditation, and learn to be happy with his life. And if we could spread happiness and joy, then even the people who are on both sides of the climate issue would start to be more friendly with each other. So, in fact, the goal here is higher, more noble 
than merely climate change. Hmm. I'm not sure if that works still in a situation where there's like an existential and very imminent threat. This world has gone through very many existential and determined threats. There have been times when 80 million people were killed in a short period of time. They say that it cost 100 million people to die in the war between the 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 most uh, the Catholics and the Protestants. Hundred years war over an idea the idea who is closer to God the mouth of the priest or the book the priest reads and a hundred million people died over that yeah. in I, a way you can say that things are getting better because in the old days if there was a climate change issue say 500 years ago then all of the people who were in favor of the uh, climate change uh, advocates, they would all have been killed. Mm. At least now they're only jailed overnight. <laughs> yeah. So in that regard, things are getting a bit better. So let's say that a few cities get flooded, like Miami. They're going to have to move people inland. Millions of people are is going to huge, big, huge displacement. Yeah. But it, but in the process, some of the displacements that have already happened are now in reversal. Do you know what I mean? I'll give you an example of Srinagal. Srinagal was in the process of heavy desertification. And people were leaving left, right, and center, doing their best to get to uh, the, the northern parts of the uh, Sahara so that they could get into Europe. But now what they're doing is they're replanting. They're putting in a green belt. And it's become so successful that some of the people who had lodged themselves actually all the way into Europe are now wanting to come home. Because now there's something to come home to because there's been some tree planting. Hmm. And in fact, they're going to start to reclaim the Sahara Desert. A little bit at a time, but they'll do it. Take some time, and as it does, it'll take people. The same thing is happening in China. China was just about to choke to death in uh, 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 Beijing because of the desert sands, but they planted enough trees that they don't have nearly as much trouble with uh, uh, sand storms in the city. Now all they have is pollution, but they're working really hard to get that done. And we'll let them work very hard at it. Our job is to be happy. Mm -hmm. And so we can recognize that, yes, there are a lot of different activities. Let me give you this one last example. There is a wagon stuck in the creek. And the farmer who has the wagon gets his farmers to come help him. And more and more people come pushing on that wagon to try to get it out of the creek. And soon there is almost no place that, on that wagon that does not have an arm on it. And everyone is pushing on that wagon. These people are pushing in that direction and these people are pushing in this direction. And everybody's got the right intention of getting the, uh, uh, the um, wagon out of the creek. And all they're going to do is destroy the wagon. Everybody is working too hard trying to help. And nobody's got any wisdom to stand back and look at what's going on here. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's what you find in politics. Way too many people pushing way too hard to try to get what they want. And you wind up having collision as opposed to friendship. So if you start with the basis of friendship, then perhaps you can get the problem solved. But you see that your, your friend who is out being an activist, he sees everybody as an enemy, except the people who are on his side. For instance, he sees the police as an enemy. Yes, he's going to get arrested. If you saw the police as friends, he wouldn't have gotten arrested. He'd have done yeah. what you, they told him to do. Yeah, I'm not, I don't have the impression that he sees everyone as an enemy, but he also talked about, for example, that it's taught him to 
enjoy every day more and to well now yeah. he's getting he, the right that's the right way to go so now it, what he's finding is having his own mind cleaned out is better than cleaning out the environment yeah i'm i'm i mean i'm younger and i haven't uh, really had experienced many existential threats or anything but it seems like this is all happening very fast and will also lead to big societal changes less food okay. being available can, and, uh, can you can you personally stop all of that that leads to all of those societal changes can you uh -huh. stop it can you stop global warming by yourself on your own no, not on my own. I could okay. maybe make the a next, little the, contribution. The next, the next question, the next question is, when that catastrophic change happens, can you manage that on your own? Um, not on my own, I think. Well, you might need a, you might need an airplane ticket. Yeah. Get out of the <laughs> But but other than that, you can manage it. Whatever mm. happens, and in fact, up in northern Europe, the only thing that's going to happen up there is probably a little bit better weather and a few more visitors could get crowded up there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like there's already quite hot summers so apparently last year i didn't even notice but there was a year there was one month where they didn't have zucchinis in the supermarket it's like a small thing but could you get yeah. over that i could get over that yeah all right so now but we're back like on schedule summer. So let's look at this from the perspective of instead of trying to fix the problems of ordinary right view and let's go into super mundane right view. Because super mundane right view has a higher quality. This is noble. And one of the most important qualities to it is, is that it has the quality of investigation. It has this kind of quality is not. You see, ordinary right view and ordinary uh, and wrong view have the quality that the viewing has been done and conclusions have been made. But noble right view means to continue to view, to continue to look, to continue to investigate. And a good word to use instead is to continue to explore. Mm -hmm. To explore, because explore has a quality of joy in it, that this stuff is fun. This is really interesting to start exploring the mind and to find out what's there. This is a kind of view that winds up being fully compassionate. In fact, right noble view is compassion because we're no longer seeing it from our own point of view. We're no longer seeing it from how this mind works, but we're looking at it from the perspective of how the human mind works. And all these humans walking around have got one of those darn things and is not very well fine-tuned or trained. Mm -hmm. But you in the process are beginning to train yours because you can take a good close look at it and view how it looks and view the way that it operates. Now, in that regard, right view has, let us say, some helpers. The first one to bring on is sati. Because right view, error now, how noble it is, is not going to do you any good if it's not there when you need it. Like the so right sati. At the right time. At the right time. So sati comes in. Sati brings in right view. They go together. Then when the sati comes, now we have to exercise right effort. In regard of ordinary right view, right effort means normally the more effort you put in, the righter the outcome will be. Work, strive, strenuous operation, etc. 
where wrong view is just simply looking for the easy way out to take what you want. So ordinary right view has the quality of work in it. It has the quality of the future. You do good now and later you'll have a good result. Therefore, we start to cling to that result that we haven't gotten yet. And that's why ordinary right view ripens in clinging. But real right view is noble, super mundane, is a part of the path and it does not lead to suffering when we have that right view. And it has these friends. One of them is sati. The second one is right effort. In this regard, right effort is, noble right effort is, the least amount of effort needed to get the job done right now. What needs to be done right now? Not working for getting some future thing, but working to get something done right now. And the least amount of work, the better. So if there's something that where I recognize, okay, this is very hard for me right now, or it would take a lot of inner struggle, at least right now, it might be better to do something different that I can do right now and see if maybe oh, later I'm in a what position you, what to do Please tell me, what are you struggling with? Uh, for example, this topic that we've touched on, on where will I uh, move after I live here or how, uh, uh, yeah, what will I do as a job or will I first travel or I, I still don't really feel ready to answer that question. Then don't. Hmm. Yeah, so that would don't be put, an example. Yeah, of, don't put yourself under any pressure at all. Take yeah. that striving and that stress away. You don't have to answer that question. Now, if you give your, uh, uh, let us say as an example, if you gave your landlord notice that you're moving out, now you've got to abide by that obligation. But since you haven't done that yet, there's no reason to abide by an obligation that you haven't made. Hmm. Yeah. But that's off in the future. Your job is to learn how to be happy in this present moment, and you will not be any more happy in this present moment if you come to the full decided conclusion, I know what I'm going to do in the future. Because you don't. You might change your mind, and you know it. The mind is fickle. It takes new information in and then it stops being so rigid. This yeah. is what right yeah. view is all about. Let's stop coming to conclusions and start enjoying the moment. Do we ever make decisions then? Can we ever make decisions then? In the moment, when it's time, when it's necessary. Hmm. Okay. And when you do make decisions, it'll probably be the right one if it's taken from noble right view. And so you don't have to plan anything in advance. You'll, you'll know how to handle it there. And this is part of what we mean by confidence. That because you understand more and more that you're able to take care of this present moment happily, that you also know that in advance sometimes that when that moment comes, that you can handle it happily also. Yeah. That's what real preparation is. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I've got a joke for you this off the off sides, but I'll tell it anyway, just for a second. And that is because Christians will actually sometimes say, Well, what if you're wrong? Because they've already made a decision that they know what is right and what is wrong. And they made the decision that God exists and you got to take Jesus as your favor and they'll get into heaven. And so they ask you, what if you're wrong? And I say, well, first off, there's a lot of people dying every minute. So to get to heaven, there must be a lot of some kind of magical airliners. For one thing, my behavior is so good, I'll at least be in first class. Where all you Christians that have to have Jesus as a savior, you're cattle, you're out in the back. Jesus wants to see the good guys first. So I'm already in first class. 
And then when I get up to the big dude, you know what I'm going to say to him? I'm going to say, dude, mosquitoes. Dude, bacteria. Dude, tsunamis. What have you been doing? <laughs> and I'll just walk out of there and I say, hey, Jesus, come, let's go get a beer. <laughs> and that's my audience with God. He's, dude, mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> but you see I don't have that's just a joke I don't have to have anything planned in advance I don't know what's going to happen way back when or uh, sorry way out there that's one of the reasons why religions and getting us all prepped for what's going to happen way into the future is exactly the same let us say bondages that we have for plaque for planning on next year. It keeps us future oriented. Yeah. And so the whole thing is, is to come back and stop living our lives as this, isn't it gonna be awful to have global warming? Instead of saying, hey, I can enjoy myself right now and when global warming, I can be happy then too. I know how to do it now. And you stop trying to be responsible for fixing a world that's broken only by some people's attitude. Because hmm. a lot of people have the attitude, hey, this is a big, wide, wonderful world, and yeah, it can get hotter, and yeah, we can lose a city or two due to, uh, to swamps and, uh, and high tides and whatnot like that, but humans are good. They can move. Sure, a few of them are going to die along the way, but look how many have died in the various wars we've had because we simply couldn't get along with each other. Maybe the world will learn to get along if the only enemy we have is global warming and everybody human is all friends with each other. I would yes. rather have a world that was having to deal with the very, very deep aspects of global warming, but everybody was working together to solve the problem rather than having the vicious fight that's going on now about it. Yeah, ironically, that seems even more far away to me than a solution to, solution <laughs> to climate change. So, in that regard, you can't fix it, but you can fix your own mind. That's what this teaching of the Buddha is. And let the rest of the people take care of the problems that they see because they are not wise enough to stop fixing problems. Hmm. For instance, the oil companies, they see there's a big problem. That's why they've been lying about global warming for 30 years. It's because they're poor. Those big executives that ride around in private jets and dine on the most expensive food, they're poor. Why? Because no matter how much money they have, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. But you, you can be a rich man. You can stop hurting people because you don't need anything. You're happy and content as you are. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if I would draw such a clear line between not hurting people and doing yeah i mean doing good is an, another it's thing not only a continuum of gray into white it's Sorry. multicolored it's extremely mm. complicated i'm just drawing two distinctions mm. but the multifaceted part of it is something that we will look at perhaps in the future as we're talking about it but right now we're looking at the distinction between wrong view ordinary right view and super mundane right view yeah yeah where yeah, super exactly. mundane right view is stop trying to fix the world's problems and start trying to fix the problems of the mind because mm -hmm. if we can get the mind straightened out then we might in fact be able to deal with the world in a more wise way an example of that would be spreading the noble dhamma that would be a much better thing to do rather than spending the night in jail. <laughs> Teach it in jail. Yeah, that's the best place. Yeah, get yourself invested intentionally so you can teach the Dhamma to all of the, um, um, uh, the activists that are uh, protesting global warming. 
teach them to do it happily. We can't stop them from doing it, but we can teach them how to do it happily. Hmm. Not sure we can get through to everybody in one night in, in, in jail, but we can touch a couple. Hmm. Okay. So we so were at so right effort. Right. We were back there to right effort because right effort is the minimal amount of effort to get the job done right here in this moment that needs to be done. And since there's something to be done right here, right now, it should be fairly easy to do. And yet a lot of people doing meditation, they work far too hard. Why? Because they want something they don't have. But if you put just a little effort into getting that which you want right now, that's a much better way of practicing. That's the important change in the way that people practice is stop practicing hard to get something in the future and start practicing easy now to enjoy the benefits of it right now. Yeah. This goes to a change of attitude. And now we're beginning to complete the four uh, points that lead to the unification of mind. But the important point is that within noble right view, one of the ways of noble right view is to see the way the mind works, to see the internal workings of the mind. And so this is how we've, in fact, we've spent 30 minutes on just the introduction now into Paticca Samapada, but wait, wait. <laughs> Before we get fully into Paticca Samapada, we have to understand something from the perspective of the five aggregates. Now, the first thing that we can see from the five aggregates is that they come immediately right out of the four foundations of mindfulness. In fact, instead of looking at the mind from the position of what's the mind's uh, capabilities and aspects as a unit, and then what are the contents of the mind, right now we're not going to be just uh, interested in the contents of the mind so much as looking at various aspects of the mind. And we're going to break it down into three groups. The, th the, uh, the first one would be called uh, consciousness, which would be the ability for a laptop computer to take in data. So you have a camera, you might have a microphone, you might have a keyboard, there might be a mouse, there might be uh, internet stuff that comes into the computer, whatever it is, you have stuff coming in from the outside and it has to be dealt with as well as other things that are happening on the inside that also have to be dealt with. This dealing with things is what we will call consciousness. And eye consciousness would be able to see with the eye. And hearing consciousness would be the ability to hear, to have sounds. But the sound itself is physical. Hearing is a mental operation. All right. An, a visible object is just an object, but seeing that object, that's a mental process. Hmm. And that's consciousness. And the first thing that we understand about this consciousness is, is that it's not me. It's not myself. This consciousness is actually dependent or rising and it's temporary. And so we have to start watching that. Here's an example of it. In fact, this is a very good thing to do. Put something that you want to read on the screen of your of your laptop for reading it. While at the same time, you put on an audio that you want to hear. It could be one news article from CNN and another a news article from Fox. Or it could be a Dhamma talk on, uh, on one thing and then a visual... A uh, uh, piece to read on the other and start listening while you begin to read and what you'll begin to see is consciousness begins to shift back and forth between the two and that eye consciousness is not the same as ear consciousness and ear consciousness is not the same as eye consciousness 
that will begin to let you understand that neither one of these con consciousnesses are, are you because each one of them temporarily arises. And if you were permanent, then consciousness could not be you. The last part, I didn't uh, get that. You, you, you start to switch between these? You can switch back and forth between I and ear consciousness and you begin to see that they're not the same thing that eye consciousness is shut off and ear consciousness comes in. Mm -hmm. And then ear consciousness has to be shut off for eye consciousness to come in. It's very difficult training to train the, the, the eyes and ears in consciousness. Now we can train the hands to perform a task while we're doing something. For instance, a piano player can play music while he's talking to a sweet young babe that's leaning on his piano at the bar. He can do that because it's using different parts of his mind. And almost none of his mind is used in consciousness of what his hands are doing. They're playing because they know how to do that. His consciousness is on the bay. Yeah. And so in this regard, consciousness moves from object to object and it's temporary. That's an important point for you to begin to recognize is, is that your consciousness is not you, couldn't be. And neither are all of the five aggregates. In fact, all of the five aggregates that we're going to be talking about are also five of the aspects of the 12 of Paticca Samuppada. And consciousness at this level is exactly one of them. It's the same thing at the at uh, Paticca Samuppada as it is in um, the five aggregates. And the most important quality when teaching it from the concept of the five aggregates is that it's not self, it's not you. So whatever you are, we haven't discovered yet, but we've already eliminated one of them. It's not consciousness. Mm -hmm. Another one we're going to eliminate is body. Because that's exactly one of the four foundations of mindfulness is one of the uh, first tetra out of Anapanasati. We're already beginning to breathe. We're already beginning to watch the body. <coughs> We're already, already in a small way beginning to allow the body real relaxation. However, that body is not you. You don't have real control over it. You can't make it thin when it's fat or fat when it's thin. You can't make it old when it's young. You can't make it young when it's old. You can't change your stature. You can't be four foot eight today and five foot 10 tomorrow and six foot 11 the next day. It just doesn't work like that. The body is not in your control basically any more than consciousness is. I, I could also conceptualize the body as just another feeling consciousness and seeing consciousness and so on. So it seems a bit to me like the body in, is contained in consciousness. Well, that's the next one too, is feeling. You can feel good, you can feel bad, you can feel uh, joy, you can feel fear, you can feel anxiety, you can feel sadness, you can feel grief. And generally, very few people have any control over how they feel. And even if they could control their feelings, in fact, by being able to control their feelings, they for sure would see these feelings are not me. These feelings come out of the body that I don't really have control over. These feelings are associated with thoughts. And this mind is not mine either. This consciousness is not me. Not only that, but uh, the next one on, in the list is Sankara. And we can think of Sankara is the sum total collection of everything about you now. It's your, all of your past collected together and delivered to us sitting on that chair right now. That's the Sankara including all of your memories. Well, guess what? You are not your memories. This is another mistake of a lot of people make. 
Sometimes you can't remember a word or an event. About the only thing that we can remember is feelings. Why? Because the feelings are generally old habits and we're very, very skilled at remembering how to feel. And so we begin to continue to feel in the same way over and over and over again, and they become very habit bound. But in the beginning, it's very hard to change your feeling from sadness into gladness just by saying, okay, I'm going to do it. Hmm. But with a skill development, you can. By developing that skill, you can begin to manage these feelings. But in the beginning, we can see that our thoughts, our memories, our consciousness, our perception, our feelings, our body is not me. These are the five aggregates, and there is no self, especially no soul, in there anywhere. That, in fact, I would say that part of the problem with the, uh, the, the language that Buddhism is written in is that this is a clear case where they missed a word, that they should have used even a more Christian word. They've used so many Christian words and gotten things so wrong, but this one, they chose an ordinary word when a Christian word would have been excellent. The Christian word I'm thinking of is the word soul. Because the self may or may not be temporary. It's almost like uh, semi-temporary to many people, or that it'll die when I die, or that it'll be reborn somehow or another. But a soul, that's definitely permanent. Right now, it's unchanging, everlasting, and it's also subject to God's intervention. In the sense, he's going to send that soul to heaven or to hell or whatever like this. And he does not expect any soul to be talking back to him and start screaming about mosquitoes. Hmm. There's no soul there. And so when we recognize inside the five aggregates that there's actually no soul there, there's nothing permanent about the body. There's nothing permanent about feelings. They come and go. There's nothing permanent about consciousness. It arises and passes away, and this one comes and that one goes. Perception is not there either. Perception is based upon, the, let us say that perception is actually the processor of the PC, the actual computer. But that's not you, because uh, that computer has to follow a, a, a set of instructions, a program. And that program is stored, and that storage system is the Sankara. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, doesn't, don't the perceptions come out of Sankara? Then? They, yes, I just said that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And the five aggregates, above all things, there's no soul in there. So now we have to discover, well, where does the self actually come from? That's when we begin to, uh, to unravel the mystery of Paticca Samuppada, because in the process of how the mind works, a concept of self is created. And that every time it's created, it's created as part of the concept is, is that it, that concept is not a concept, it's real, and it's always there. But the concept itself is not there, it's not real, and it's not there all the time. It comes, and when it comes, it says, I'm always here. And then when it goes away, it's not there. But when it comes back, it comes back and says, I'm here all the time. And then it goes away again. And then it comes back up again with the delusion, I'm here all the time. Consciousness and self work like that. We think that they're there all the time when in fact they're not. They're temporary. They arise and they pass away. Here's an example of that. In the old days before we had digital movies, in the old days when we had even digital photos, movies were done on film. And that the way that they operated was that the camera would very quickly take one uh, picture after another after another. These were called frames, and they would have 24 frames a second. Okay, there was a time between that flash of the screen to take that recording, and then the film in the camera had to move and the shutter was closed. 
and then it opens again and it takes a photo again and then it closes the aperture and then the, the film machine runs on to set up the next frame and then it flashes again and opens it up. The same thing, by the way, happens on, in reverse at the time when the movie is going to be shown. And that is, they set a frame, and then they shine a light to it, and then they shut that light off. Now, in the old days, that was an arc light. You don't actually shut the, the, the light itself off, but what you do is you put a blind frame on a, on a wheel that's got uh, open and closed places so that the frame goes dark. The screen goes dark. The machine then resets it to the next frame, and then that wheel moves on and that one is shown on the screen. And then the next one is the wheel goes black again. And then it sets it to move the next frame. That's why it clicks and clacks. And in the old days in, uh, in the Navy, we call them a flick. Because you could actually, in the really old films, you could see the flicker. Okay. But when people go to a modern movie now, they think that they're, if they're watching a movie that lasts an hour and 30 minutes, they're watching an hour and 30 minutes of mo a movie. Oh, no, they're not. They're only watching 45 minutes of movie. The rest of the time, the screen was black, blank, empty. Mm. And they didn't know it. Because things were happening too fast. Yeah. Okay, so your mind works like that, too. And we have then the delusion that I'm here all the time, where in fact, there's a lot of time that you're not there. There's no self. But when it comes up, you know it's there. Selfishness arises temporarily based upon a set of conditions. That's, in fact, what the word Petitia Sadhmapada means. And if you look at the word dependent origination, the self, arises dependently it originates dependently and when those conditions or dependencies go away the self goes away and when those dependencies arise again the self will arise again this is what we mean by dependent origination we also think of it and talk about it in the sense of cause effect that this causes that this stops this stops too this could cause this happened. And a big example of that would be global warming. Global warming comes, activists comes. Global warming goes away, the activists go away. Global warming comes back again, the activists come back again. Okay. And, and so we could take the word global warming in, out of it, and put in, in a word something like a disaster happens or a disaster might happen. And so the disaster happens and then people who don't like it they come up. The disaster is finished. And they go back to sleep. Another disaster comes. And here that same crowd comes up hating that disaster. And when that disaster is finished, they go back to sleep. This is human nature. This is a cause and effect relationship. And there's quite a lot of that stuff that goes on inside the mind. Now, today, we're not going to be able to finish all of the details of Paticca Samapada, but we can see there's enough to where there's various parts in there, including the body. And that the way that we talk about the body in relationship to Paticca Samapada is, is that it's called bodily sankara. And then we do language. We have the ability to think. And with that, we call that learned language. We call that verbal sankara. And then we have a third kind of uh, uh, sankara that we would call sita sankara, but in this realm is actually more emotional. That what we, in English language we would think of as verbal sankara is actually the functioning of the mind at the verbal level or the level of thought. For example, for, for instance, a guy who lives in Germany, grew up in Germany and spent his whole life in Germany will have not only different language and words to speak of than a guy who was living in, let us say, Spain. And so the sum total of living in Spain then is going to give him the Spanish language, the Spanish way of looking at things, and all of that's going to be stored in language sankara or the verbal sankara to where the German 
is going to have the German language with German viewpoints, German ideas, and the way that German language is used, he's going to have that stored as his verbal Sankara. But this emotional Sankara is basically the old stuff about how we feel about things. And we're in the habit of it. So that when similar things happen over and over again, we wind up feeling the same way about it over and over again because we don't have any control over our feelings. They're automatic. If this arises, this feeling arises. When that goes away, that feeling goes away. And sometimes when this, that, and the other thing arise, and this, that, and the other feeling arise all at the same time, too. <laughs> it gets get complicated. But everything is done with cause and effect. Now, basically how it goes is these various kinds of Sankara then um, operate with and uh, cause damage to and also correct processing from the computer itself, this perception. So that something comes from the outside, a, uh, a consciousness, and then that consciousness needs to be processed into something of understanding. For instance, I see something out there and I process it enough to say it's a tree. I can then process it more and remember about the time when I was 14 that I fell out of a tree, broke my leg. And now off I go into a wild goose chase about old memories and, and old bad trees when it wasn't a tree's fault at all. So this is how that Sankara can get loop-de-loop -loop, rather than just recognizing the tree. Is that a lot of stuff will come out of that Sankara when I'm just trying to process that I see a tree. With that stuff, this process, then, it takes on an internal representation of the mind. Time for a poly lesson. That internal representation of the mind in poly is called salayatana. The salayatana is different from atana because atana is the actual sense organs themselves. For instance, the eyes, the ears, the taste the touch sensations, to where the salayatana is the internal representation of those things. And that that has to be processed into place. And the processing of it, done with old memories, is subject to being a mistake. Our salayatana doesn't fit the actual reality very well. So, uh, well, it's a matter of degree of processing, I think, right? Because all the things I see and so on, I still perceive, but these things are more representative and more abstract and thereby also more and, subject to error. Uh-huh. And not only that, but the, this is how we understand things. That we do not understand things directly from the outside world. We understand things from a mental conception that we have concocted or processed together. Now, here's the thing that's kind of interesting. In English language, we use words something like realize this. I realize we can't realize a tree. What does that mean? That I'm going to have an actual tree growing out of the top of my head? That makes no sense. We can't realize a tree. What we do is we mentalize a tree. Or in this regard, we say, oh, I see what you mean. Now I have mentalized or taken what you've told me as a story out of language, Sankara, and created a mental image. I processed that mental image out of my hearing. I mean, real realizing would just be seeing things directly, like processes happening. Ah, yes, exactly. So this is a corollary that we can make. The closer your internal representation is to actual reality, the less suffering there will be. And the further away from reality your salayatana is, the more likely there will be suffering involved because you've missed the mark. You've seen something that you missed. You didn't see everything that you could have seen because you were too busy looking at something that wasn't really important, but you liked it or something like that. 
Okay, so now this is an important thing. You live your life based upon an internal representation of reality. You do not live in reality. It's not possible for a human being to actually live in reality. Mm. Okay, yeah. You live in a mental world. A lot of people don't like to hear that. So there's something for you to investigate. That you do live in that salayatana, that internal world. Now the processing we is called in the Pali Nama Rupa. Nama Rupa means I'm taking an outside object, the Rupa, and I'm naming it or giving it all of the internal qualities. So Nama Rupa is the processing of that outside object, turning it into an internal object turning it into a name and form that's on the inside, no longer a rupa, something that's physically reality on the outside. And that, then, is what contacts us. This contact could actually be considered a different kind of consciousness than the consciousness that we were talking about in the beginning. Mm. Okay. All right. Why is that? Because I can see the tree and then I can say, I see that the tree could use some, uh, some medicine. Or I see that the tree needs to have the monkeys come pick the coconuts out of it. In other words, we're conceptualizing things, but that's what hits us is that's the power.